Hey folks, welcome to the Retention Recipes webinar. I'm your host, Cody Stover. Wherever you're joining us from today, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're happy to have you here. We hope you're sipping on a good coffee or tea or something else. Um, we're also very thankful to have Randy Epp, the product director from Musora Media here today. So today's retention recipe, he's gonna talk about how his team at Musora was able to do some pretty cool things with um, personalization and kind of taking a targeted approach to winning back some of their users who were thinking about churning, um, which I know is why you all probably signed up. I'm gonna give Randy kind of a more formal introduction here in a minute and we'll get into the, the good stuff um, in that story here pretty soon. But just to kick us off, um, I actually, I still receive the physical newspaper. Um, I live in Portland, Oregon here, so I still get the Oregonian delivered twice a week, which physical newspapers is probably a churn and retention story all in of itself. We won't get into that today, but um, this is not news to any of you probably here in the audience, but this is a clip that stood out to me the other day. Um, talking about the economy, this guy, John Higgins said, uh, we don't think we've seen the worst of it yet. As recession hits, U.S. corporate profits are forecasted to fall 14 to 20 percent. The S&P 500 is expected to slide um, up to another 6 percent. So not to just start with some doom and gloom, but just to kind of um, use that as some context setting here as we get into why are we talking about retention today? Um, why is Randy going to just share some stuff with us? I think we, we're just seeing across the board that consumers and businesses are kind of looking more critically at their budgets and saying, is this a tool that we need or is this a service that I'm getting value at right now? And as kind of these doom and gloom type articles come out, people are constantly having that thought of how can I cut down? So I think the importance of today's event is we'll talk through some cool use cases and stories, but I'm also excited just kind of to start really thinking critically too about this retention strategy and how do you make sure that your product or service stays in what somebody deems to be their essential products that they have, um, whether you're on the B2B side or the B2C side. So um, I'm excited to get into it. Audience, as you're joining, we wanna hear from you. I'm actually gonna post a poll here. I'm curious um, what retention has been like for your company up to this point. So I'm gonna post this first poll um, and it reads directly, how much is your company focused on retention up to this point? Is it very much? You've done a lot of uh, retention campaigns. Is it somewhat, you have uh, some campaigns going, but maybe it's an area you wanna focus on more or is it, not much, um, but maybe looking to scale it up as you come into this event. So go ahead and look in the right hand tab there in the polls section and let us know kind of where your organization's at for retention. Randy, real quick is uh, where would you fall on this uh, list? Is retention something that Musora is always focused on? Uh, so back when I joined the company in 2017, you literally had to call in order to cancel. <laughs> so I would say that was a very strong retention strategy, if uh, not illegal at some point. Um, so quickly when we went to online cancellation, I, I think we started to realize how many people drop off at that point. But it really became an issue for us uh, actually as the pandemic hit and we started you know, doubling or tripling up our sales numbers from before and people came to renewal and were like, oh, it's a lot of money now actually in the renewal chain. So uh, that was a big shift for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we're going to hear a little more about the shift from the, the phone cancellation uh, to more of the automated approach here later on. Um, it looks like we're getting a lot of folks saying, um, answering with that not much answer, but looking to scale it up. So that's great news. That's why we're here. That's why we're talking. So um, yeah, we're excited to share some more there. One more poll here really quick as we let folks join. Let me trigger this next one. Would love to know um, how long is the average customer lifetime at your company? Is it one to six months that customers usually stick around? Is it six months to a year? Is it one to two years? Or is it that kind of longer term life cycle, two years plus? And as you answer this poll question, I just want to preface and say too that this really, there's a lot more behind this. B2C, B2B are totally different industry standards. There's a lot of difference between fintech, edtech, mobile apps. Um, so would love to see those answers come in, but uh, know that there's a lot of nuance probably in that. Randy, real quick, where, where do you guys kind of lie on this? Well, we sell a variety of different types of memberships. Obviously, if you buy an annual membership, you're going to be one plus years. Um, I would say for annuals, we're above that two year mark. For monthlies, you know, anywhere between, you know, depending on how you rate them and the source and stuff, between six months and two years. 
Gotcha. It looks like um, folks, as you join, go ahead and keep answering there. But it looks like we're kind of across the board, which I think is pretty normal. You might be in SaaS, um, so you might have kind of more of those annual contracts. You might be a, a mobile app with a quick quick subscription. Um, that might have that shorter one. So definitely some variation. Okay, well, we're going to jump in. Um, like I said, I'm Cody. I'm on the marketing team here at Custom Rail. Just a quick overview of Custom Rail for folks who uh, maybe have not heard of our platform before or used us. So we're a cross-channel customer engagement platform. So that means that any kind of data and messaging workflow you can bring in to our platform and run it from there. So usually people start with messaging. So you get your newsletters set up. You can also bring in your um, product triggered campaigns, any kind of drip series that you're running, um, really any kind of automated messaging that you want to send, you can consolidate that into customer IO across email, push notifications, SMS. Um, you can do a lot with in-app messages across web and mobile, kind of those pop-ups within your app. And I think once you get the messaging figured out, a lot of people then move into the data side of customer IO. So in some cases, this means you can replace Zapier, doing a lot of things with webhooks too maybe update a record in your CRM when something happens in another platform and kind of running all of those logic-based data decisions in Custom Rail. So a lot you can get into. We're really proud to work with um, a lot of different companies and a lot of different industries. You see Musora there at the top, um, that logo. They're kind of in the music learning space. Um, other companies like Notion and Buffer in the SaaS space. Uh, EdTech, you see DataCamp down there. All in all, just lots of different industries that, um, as a matter of fact, all care about engaging their users and retention. So we're super proud to work with them. We're going to get into Randy's story here in just a second, but um, this is kind of the customer rail workflow builder. So uh, what I just described, these data and messaging automation, this is where you're actually in here building, um, dragging and dropping things in from the left to kind of create that exact experience that you want. And I know, Randy, you're probably no stranger to this view inside of customer rail kind of building things out. And I know that you're going to provide some screenshots for us um, later on in this kind of looking at exact campaign examples that you built out. But um, first off, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is Randy Epp, Product Director at Misora Media. And as he puts it, his superpower is turning ideas into interactive experiences. So we're gonna kind of dig deeper into what that actually means. But Randy, maybe to kick us off, what is Misora and what are your responsibilities there? Yeah, sure. So Musora is a collection of sub-brands, so Drumio, Piano, Guitario, and Singio. We provide online lessons in those uh, instruments, so drums, piano, guitar, and vocals. Um, we're, I think, the biggest online drum education platform, uh, maybe not in China, but like in the rest of the world. And uh, we're a quickly growing brand, I'd say, in the other areas. <clears throat> so we started, um, let's say, 2006 with our founder, basically filming uh, drum technique videos in a chicken barn in this small town of BC oh, nice. and selling them via eBay. And it's steadily grown from there. Uh, I think as I said earlier, I joined in 2017 um, in a marketing role. So I used to do all the ad buying and stuff like that. I sw slowly switched into a marketing operations role and I am currently product director. So we have a team of 30 developers, designers, and a data team. And, uh, yeah, we just work on improving the members area platform, which is our primary product, as well as we also have this other arm of the company, which is definitely our media side. So a couple million subscribers on Dromeo, uh, one on YouTube, one and a half million, I think on piano, a million on Guitario. This thing is also kind of developing there. So we got kind of this two sides of the business, but uh, I'm more focused on the members area. I love it. I recently watched the uh, Netflix documentary where they talk about how Netflix started as like people like sending out DVDs via the mail, very manual, very like um, bare bones. And so I love any kind of story, as you just said right there, um, started making drum videos in a, a chicken barn. Um, I love those stories where it starts there and then you just scale it up. Yeah, we've been bootstrapped the entire Great. way, so no outside investment yet. I love it. All right, well, for folks who have just joined us, um, thanks so much for being here, welcome. Um, there's some polls you can respond to there in the right to let us know kind of where you're at with your company. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and dive in and take a quick look here at the agenda and where we're gonna go. So today's retention recipe that we're looking at is how Musora was able to reduce subscriber churn by 
And we're going to kind of go chronologically. So we're going to talk about the before state, what challenges and needs um, did Divisora have leading into the campaign that we're going to show. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty of the campaign. What were what was the data um, we were trying to target? And then also talk about content and how that was personalized based on different users experience. And then we'll kind of round it out with uh, the results. What were the retention numbers? What did this actually impact? How did we measure? Um, so as we go through this, go ahead and there's going to be time for Q and A at the, the end, but you can go ahead and put questions in the chat so that we can um, respond on the fly. I think we both have found that adds a lot of flavor to the event. If you come in and ask your question, right, when we were talking about the specific thing. So don't be shy, put questions in there, um, put comments and yeah, we're looking forward to a good event. Okay, so Randy, to get us started, talk to us about the Musora membership model and why did retention matter to you in the first place? Uh, sure. So at the very base level, I would say there is uh, everything in here is going to reference kind of like our old membership model. If you go on Musora.com, it's a little bit different now, um, but this will be, I guess, what we did previously. Uh, so we have a couple of tiers now. It makes everything more complicated. I wanted to make sure that it's straightforward. So uh, basically, I would say we always front load our annual offer with a lot of bonuses. Uh, we tend to sell a lot more annual memberships than we do monthly memberships. They tend to have a greater lifetime value. So we try to push that. So uh, you can buy on as an annual member or you can buy on as a monthly member. You can also buy through our website directly or through the mobile app stores. So we're also listed on Google Play and the Apple Store. Um, as a kind of overall thing, uh, we try to include everything we do within the membership uh, where we can outside of some stuff that's like specifically licensed, but basically it's an all in one access pass. Um, there is a slight variation in that we do sell off one off like cohort classes, which is like everyone does the course together at the same time, or we'll sell off one off packs because some people don't like to be tied to a membership. Some of them will just like to buy. I want one and done and I want lifetime access. So we do provide that as well through our platform. And one thing you'll see only sometimes listed is we do actually sell lifetime memberships as well. So people who have been annual for a couple of years or will sometimes upsell for monthly even. Um, and that kind of averages out to about five years of annual. Yeah, I, I, that probably extends that lifetime value number way up when you get people on lifetime, that's awesome. And what was yeah, kind of, talk to us through, oh, go ahead. I think we got a slight delay. It's okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'll go. Um, no, thanks for talking to the membership model. Um, I wanted to know more too, like what was kind of this um, before state as you were getting into focusing more on building out this retention campaign we're about to see, like what specific challenges or what specific context was maybe important um, to the business as you were heading into this? Sure. Um, so back when I first started, we, we would only have like, you know, maybe 100, 200 cancellations in a month. Um, so we did a very manual process. Um, again, in the very early days, you had to cancel via the phone. Uh, so you'd actually have to call us up and end the membership. Then we moved to online cancellations. They could cancel within the app when we launched the app as well as on the web platform. And uh, basically what would happen is they would fill out, they'd hit the cancellation button. We'd immediately cease billing on their account and then we'd follow up with them. So we had literally one person whose role it was to be the retention specialist. So he created a bunch of email templates. He would send them. We were still using Gmail as our support inbox at that time. Um, so he would manually send out emails to them. Uh, we would try to like come up with offers based on like what they've done in the past. It was a very time intensive process. Um, he was able to manage the amount of workflow we had at that time. But as we started to grow more and more, it was like we're spending a lot of manual time doing this process. We're starting to do like inconsistent offers. Sometimes there's typos in the emails because you're copy pasting that kind of stuff. I'm sure we can do this better. We were using a different tool um, at the time when we started to get into this. Um, however, we kind of quickly ran into issues with um, either events not being like time stamped properly, or we had some issues with um, throughput. So we would have too many events going through and it would get backlogged in the pipeline and like you get cancellation emails like 48 hours after you canceled rather than immediately after and uh some of the tools and the builders and stuff weren't that good so when we kind of set out looking to like really level up our next one that's kind of when we went into tool exploration and 
we eventually ended up at customer.io after actually a lead from a, a coffee I had with someone else. But uh, basically everything was a little bit chaotic. We were sending out manual processed emails and we just need, knew something had to change. As you're talking through that, it, it makes me think like, um, really interesting to see kind of how it went from that super manual process to the more automated one. But regardless of which level of technicality the process had, it's still at the base of it was this need to uh, communicate with someone in, in an exact moment where the cancellation was fresh or the retention moment was, you know, they're about to cancel or they are canceling and we have our quick period. So as we kind of see on this screenshot, um, we pulled in one of kind of like now your, your data log coming in um, when people are, you know, canceling or, or showing off key behaviors there coming into custom rail, which obviously all anonymized, um, no user info there, but uh, either way, either process, whether you're sending it manually or you're using something automated, really getting in on those key moments and being able to say, hey, at this moment, send them this offer, send them this thing. Um, seems like something that's super yeah. important either way. Yeah, I would say since 2018, we've been kind of slowly building out our process. So uh, I was originally in marketing operations and <laughs> uh, basically I noticed because of how in marketing we try to automate a lot of stuff, at least in our company we did, as far as our web hooks and trying to make all the processes that were like everyday tasks or stuff we do all the time, automate them as fully as we could. So I saw that this was an opportunity for us to go in there, recover more money, make it a profit center, and hopefully also reduce the amount of like manual labor that we had to do in there. Um, so everything kind of existed in a before state. It's just we processed that and things. So there was still like, instead of a web hook from our platform to customer.io, it was an email that we generated and sent to an inbox. So it's just little steps, right? Yeah, everything in the right direction. Okay, so let's talk about the campaign now. Um, first off, before we actually get into the messages and the way that you are building out this campaign, what does the cancellation process look like for y'all at Misora? Yeah, sure. I'll walk you guys through it quick. I took some screenshots. So this is your uh, members account details area within our platform. Um, so as a member to one of the platforms, you're a member to all of them. So uh, depending on which type of membership you have, it'll show up in here. Uh, this one is a for a Misora broadband membership. So here it says Mizora annual membership. And then I would just click on the cancel button at this point in order to go to the next step. And then after you hit cancel, we ask you the reason you're canceling. Um, so we find people aren't always completely truthful in here. A lot of times it'll be price, let's say, or they're just not into it. Um, so either they'll give you a reason and of being priced, but it's actually something else. They just don't have the value because the price is too high or, uh, you know, they'll say, I don't like the lesson quality, but it's because they can't actually play it on their tablet because it's too old or like their uh, internet streaming in their home isn't very good. So we try to collect this information, but we also understand that there's a variety of factors that can play into which reason they select or they can type their own feedback. We do find, you know, probably like five to 10% of people will just type in a couple paragraphs on exactly what they think is wrong with your product, which is fantastic. And it's a great way to uh, learn. So uh, from there, you hit cancel membership if you want to continue on. Um, and I would say this screen is a good reason why you should go audit your cancellation system. Um, so we do have a tell us how to improve thing. Um, but whoever made the form also asked the exact same list of reasons that we just went through. So it's a little bit redundant. So that's a part we caught actually in reviewing for this. Um, but one thing we do like to do is if they didn't do the other option is we do like to ask them for a specific, like uh, thing, if they're willing to tell us, we don't want to make it a required part of before you cancel and it's successful. Um, but we do want to do the follow-up and we'll also send that as an email as well. Uh, so from there, uh, yeah. if they still have time on their account, they can go to their dashboard, but other than that, they're done canceling. Randy, I was going to ask, well, audience members too, would love if you chime in on the chat, um, let us know what kinds of valuable information you're, can you're uh, capturing maybe during cancellation process or what other things you've seen to be helpful to cancel at that moment. Randy, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts, um, advice to the audience. If you're building out kind of like this form to capture information during cancellation, I saw you had maybe 10 different options or eight different options. It was a pretty long list. 
do you recommend starting with a lot of options and then scaling down or start with just a few options and then add as you see kind of more come through that feedback? I would say four of them make up the top, like, uh, or make up 80% of all seasons. Uh, so I would say if we wanted to, we could probably get away with like four or five options and do other. Um, we do like to provide a pretty broad set, but all those were informed by when we had uh, someone actually going through all the emails and like taking phone calls for cancellations. Because we do have an audience that actually likes to phone us fairly often. So when we went through all the emails that we had of all the requests for cancellation, and all the people who like wrote out the paragraphs, we consolidated those down. I think we had like 30 different overall reasons and we kind of narrowed it down to I think nine or 10. It sounds like either way, a great exercise to kind of like go through those periodically too, to see what people are actually writing um, along with their reason too. Just probably some really valuable insights, both product side and marketing side. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of our product roadmap that uh, comes from either cancellation or from like a form feedback um, and like from lifetime members as well. Obviously we wanna take feedback from a wide variety of sources. That's a whole product talk. We can do that another day. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> all right, so you've got all this data now, um, this valuable data on why people are canceling what they're saying. Um, now, what do you do with it? How do you kind of come up with this plan before you even start the campaign to figure out what you're gonna offer them or what you're gonna give them to win them back? Yeah, sure. Uh, so this is the original document, I think, from back when we were planning something called on-screen offers. Um, so this wasn't part of the cancellation process you just saw. But sometimes before we even let them cancel, we'll give them like two on-screen offers based on which thing they put in there. So one of the things we did is we also copied this for the email campaigns. But for every cancellation reason, uh, we can generally have an offer that meets that need. Um, so let's say that the lessons were too hard for them. Um, generally that's a problem of like, they didn't get into the right lessons at the beginning. So one of the key things that we try to offer them uh, is stu a personalized student support plan. So we have a, a thing called mentors, uh, which is basically our support staff. A lot of them are musicians. We'll pair them up with uh, people who have the right musical like skill set um, with whatever they're learning. And they'll provide a recommendation of, they will talk to them quickly. They will ask them like kind of where they're at, what kind of stuff uh, they like to play, all that good stuff. And kind of give them, here's like the courses you should go through. Um, and then oftentimes we'll, also offer to like refresh their 90 day money back guarantee window so that there's no real risk for them if if after 90 days they're still not happy we'll still refund their money we'll still cancel everything all that good stuff so and uh also part of this is this would have been the initial list so i would say we tried to mix in other offers just in case we thought uh, the, the reason was different from what they provided to us so uh some of the things are like, kind of like code words for too expensive so we'll try to either offer them the student success plan or the lower monthly rate or a combination. So it's kind of like a list of offers we've gone through over time. Yeah, for people in the audience who maybe are like gonna launch into kind of this process of kind of documenting their reasons and documenting their offers, um, who would you recommend they collaborate with? Is this like product and sales and marketing all together? Is it something that marketing owned at Musora? Who should be in the room? Um, I spent a lot of time with, um, we call them student experience team here, uh, but primarily frontline support. So the people actually on the calls, actually in the emails. So, uh, generally they won't put it into exactly like the wording I would use. However, the, the sentiment's always there. So, uh, you, you have to listen to them and understand like kind of what the core frustration for all the students is. So I would say that's kind of like where it comes down to. And I actually hopped on the phone with a couple of people myself. So uh, people who have canceled, I just called them up. Hey, I, I noticed you said this. Can I ask you a few more questions about it? So. Yeah, taking it one step further, doing that customer research. I like it. Okay, so you've got the data. You've made this plan of what you're going to offer based on the reason. Um, let's actually get into kind of the tactical approach to building out a campaign. So. Um, I jumped to this next slide. Um, this screenshot, if you've been in customer IO, is a very zoomed out view of an overall um, campaign. And don't let it be intimidating. Um, there's lots of different paths going on. But Randy, 
talk to us about how you are kicking off this campaign. How are you triggering it? And what are we seeing here in this big spider web of messages? Sure. So before they even get into, so I have a bunch of qualifications for people who should get retention messaging or not. Um, for example, one of the common behaviors is you'll sign up for an annual membership and immediately cancel because you don't want to forget and have it renew in a year's time and <laughs> you don't have to go through that entire process of getting a refund and all that kind of stuff. So for those people who have just started in the platform, we don't want to send them retention messaging immediately. We kind of want to delay that off until they're actually about to expire. Um, and like, we'll message things a little bit differently if they've been using the platform versus if they haven't. Um, Cause I think a lot of what it comes down to is people's intent to continue learning more so than if they've been learning or not. Um, and then, so after we've kind of done that filter, we've made sure that we're not sending messaging to people uh, that shouldn't be receiving it based on where they are with our company. Uh, then they'll filter down by the individual reasons they did in the cancellation menu. So, um, so if they're not using it enough, that's one kind of campaign flow. If it's too expensive, that's another campaign flow and et cetera. So really this is all just containing all of these like different reasons within one campaign so that we know where to log in and go update the emails. I love what you're saying there about like, uh, thinking more about their intent versus their activity in some of these cases. I'm thinking um, in college, I did a lot of Spanish um, training and I haven't done that for the last 10 years very much. Um, although in the back of my mind, my intent with these uh, language apps that I'm on, my intent is that I am going to carve out the time to get back into that, even though my app activity is maybe not uh, where it needs to be. So um, as you were talking about that, I just kind of was thinking about my own consumer behavior there and, and saying, yeah, I. I actually would stay on that Spanish language learning app that I, even if I haven't done anything for two months, um, my intent's still there um, in some cases, um, even if my activity's low. Okay, so we talked through kind of, you started talking about how you're also splitting here by those reasons that we kind of saw earlier mm -hmm. for cancellation. So taking another zoom in here on the campaign, we're actually um, blowing up just two of those paths that are sitting side by side. So. Talk to us about what we're seeing here. How are you kind of personalizing the experience for each of those different reasons that we saw? Yeah, sure. So I grabbed about a month's worth of data here uh, from last year. So I think these are two of the bigger branches. Um, so it's so like for too expensive and stuff like this. I think in the full campaign, we send about six or seven emails. Really what we found is the first three are kind of the critical ones and especially the first one. Mm. Uh, one thing we played around a lot with in testing was, you know, do we delay, do we allow this like cooling off period after they've hit cancel before sending them an offer? And we've always consistently found that, no, just send it immediately after uh, they've canceled. Because um, we're, we're trying to basically keep the conversation going. As long as we can keep emails going back and forth, uh, we're, we're much more likely to retain them as a student. So basically the two paths here. One of these is too expensive and one was the not using it column. So as you see, as they go down, uh, click rates will drop usually over time, depending on how enticing your headline is and um, kind of conversion will change. I didn't include, oh, I did conver include conversion data there. So, I mean, you're seeing like 6% of people converted back into members area access after doing that email. So yeah, uh, each of these is done the offer according to the reason I did. Yeah, that's really helpful to have kind of the metrics you flipped on there too for each message and each path. If somebody in the audience is building this out, um, I think that in this little screenshot, we actually snipped out um, a couple messages in the flow that are down below. But what would you recommend for like number of touches in kind of one of these flows? Is it just a few? Should you keep following up with people in this flow for a few weeks? What would you kind of say as far as cadence? Uh, I think we in total do it over about a week and a half. I think that we do a couple of touch points up front. So here you can see two day delays. We've tried like one day delays. We've tried six hour delays. It can start to feel needy pretty quickly. You can start to feel like the Duolingo um, if you're not careful. Um, <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know, Duolingo is very aggressive with uh, how they do notifications and emails. We try to be a feel good company and that doesn't form, I think some of the things we do, we don't want to, uh, leave a bad impression, which maybe makes us a little bit more on the cautious side. Um, 
But yeah, I would say that immediate touch point and depending on like what kind of a service you are, uh, you kind of have to feel it out for yourself. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have a lot of other extra advice there, but I would say A-B test them. It's pretty easy in the platform to copy over a whole chain. You know, do one with uh, one day intervals, do one with, you know, six hour intervals, do one with like three day intervals, just see what happens. When in doubt, test it out. I, uh, folks in the audience, if you have thoughts here, questions that you want to um, dig deeper into, we're going to look at the message, um, individual messages here in just a second, but go ahead and post those in the chat. We're happy to answer to them. Um, Randy, as you were talking about that, um, wanting to provide a good experience, not be too needy, err on the side of caution as far as like how aggressively you're hitting them. Um, I'm thinking back to, I used to go to this gym in town actually canceled when COVID hit because I just wasn't sure if I wanted to be in, in a room with a ton of people at that very moment um, anymore. But um, that was my first time canceling with that gym. And I know that gyms are a totally different industry, but I remember it was such a hard process to cancel. Um, some of the links were unlisted in Google and I couldn't figure out how to get to the actual cancellation page. Um, c calling in was difficult. You're stuck in a phone tree. Long story short, it was a terrible cancellation process. And then um, when COVID got better and I was thinking about make, getting a gym membership again, I did not think of going back because I was like, oh my gosh, I think I might get stuck if I go again because I won't be able to figure out how to cancel. So um, I'm just thinking about that as you were telling that story of providing a good cancellation experience, um, a cancellation experience without a ton of friction could actually be something really good to um, eventually win them back, leave somebody with a good taste in their mouth, um, even in the cancellation process when they weren't getting maybe enough out of it right in that moment still have a happy feeling um, a few months later when maybe they reprioritize something. So that, that's cool to hear. Well, and like one thing we keep in mind is Fender, which is a big guitar manufacturer, they did some research and they were generous enough to put it out public. But 90% of people who start playing guitar quit within the first year. Um, so we, we hope that we keep more people than that, like if they decide to do our method for instruction. But there is quite a fall off and like, if you're not paying the instrument, you don't really need us unless you like really want to keep seeing our content uh, that's like non-educational. So it's always just kind of something to keep in mind. What are the factors that affect your business? Don't just copy what someone else does. Try to think about your user a bit. Yeah. We got one uh, question here in the chat. So Vladislav asks, um, notice there were A-B tests for email. What's your approach to A-B testing? Is it subject line, body of email or something else? Yeah, Randy, how do you guys approach A-B testing? I like to be dramatic. Um, I'm a little bit dramatic as a person, I would say sometimes, as far as like things. But uh, with email tests, I'm looking for like 10% to 20% changes. I'm not looking for, you know, a percentage or two increments because uh, our business is quite flexible. It changes a lot. Um, kind of like motivations behind certain things can change quite a bit month to month. And there's like seasonality at play. So in order to find like something that actually works, I need to make big swings. Um, so I think when we like look at the next email, there's one kind of prov provocative uh, email headline that we tried out and that worked really well. And like we will oftentimes play with like pretty dramatic email headlines, pretty dramatic buttons, dramatic changes in offers. You know, when we're doing ads and stuff like that, we'll try like one sentence copy versus like four paragraph copy that kind of stuff. So I would say if you're trying to do minor stuff, people don't read anyways for the most part. Um, so make sure that your uh, headings are big and bold and that your uh, subject lines are attention grabbing. Yeah, so what I was talking about here was coffee, booze, or piano, where we basically like tie it to uh, those other uh, things you could be buying. Um, I don't know if, how effective as an actual message it is, but it does get that email opened uh, very often. So. And one of the things I'm going to highlight quickly is that we don't actually do discounting anymore um, just because of how our model has changed a bit. So we have to also be kind of dramatic now uh, with what we're offering students as far as either more personalized support or like uh, additional lifetime bonuses or stuff like that. So it's all in the context of the brand. Yeah, Vladislav, thanks for the question there. Folks continue to put questions in, but um, we kind of transitioned us really nicely into this next um, slide as you started talking about it. But uh, we're looking at two messages from that 
uh, flow that we were just looking at. So on the left is the message that's responding to the um, price or it was too expensive was the offer. And then on the right, we have the message um, that's responding to somebody saying that they just weren't using um, the platform. So Randy kind of, yeah, you kind of started alluding to it already, but anything else you would highlight here um, that's to note or that was interesting about the content or copy between these two messages? Yeah, sure. So I, I think at the time to put this in context, I think our monthly rate would have been 29.99 US a month. So this was a pretty deep discount um, so that we were testing at the time. And that actually worked really well to boost overall lifetime value because once people were on this rate, they felt like it was something they really valued and they didn't want to cancel even if they stopped playing. Um, because I, I think this is equivalent to our annual membership price at the time. So when I was talking earlier about, um, so too expensive, I mean, that's a pretty obvious reason. We just straight up offered them a discount. Um, what ended up actually working best was that one on the right. <laughs> so this was a steep discount combined with a 90 day money back guarantee, which actually I think is the, one of the bigger factors. So we renewed their uh, refund window and we also gave them personal guidance. So we put them in touch with one of our piano instructors and they developed kind of like a, a plan for what they should be doing next. Um, so we, I think we've actually used that offer on quite a few different reasons. Um, so basically the, the text will wrap the offer with, will change based on the reasoning, but the offer stays steady. Um, so depending on how aggressive we want to retain people is how aggressive our offer will be. Um, <laughs> but uh, we have tried things with like uh, just the student success plan or just renewing the 90-day money get back guarantee if they're not sure if they're going to continue using it, that kind of stuff. And we've had, uh, I think, different success across different ones. But essentially what seems to be important, and anyone who's a marketer will know this, is what is your offer <laughs> and uh, how do you contextualize One of the things that I love here is, you know, as we're zoomed out looking at these two messages, it's not like they are, um, this is some crazy like HTML uh, dynamic content, um, you know, wild looking email. Um, but I think what I love about it is like the personalization and the strength of the personalization comes in that it is geared exactly to what this person told you was their need or their reason. And, um, and then it, responds to that in a really straightforward way. Um, I, I love the simplicity of it. And I also love that. I think like as a takeaway, as, as even internally at customer, I was, we're thinking about win back or retention, um, thinking less about having to come up with something super like magical and new age, as far as the design or doing that sort of personalization, um, or pulling in some really interesting attribute with liquid, but instead focusing more on like, do we really understand the customer super well? And then, are we saying something really clearly back to them? Um, I do love the coffee, booze, or piano subject line test, though. I think that's that's kind of a cheeky way to test out the really straightforward one on the right and then the one on the left where the message is really straightforward, but maybe the subject line makes them think, what, what is this talking about to start? Yeah, I'm going to give the, the credit for that one to our, uh, what is he, uh, VP marketing that does the piano content, and uh, he's come up with some real real good subject lines for us in the past. Obviously not using piano, it's not the most exciting one, but uh, he's got a variety of like those coffee booths or piano ones, or uh, where do I send your free and something else. And, like, there's all sorts of different ones he does, but uh, I don't know where I was going. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, 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 that's great. I, I love it. I think like from a copywriting standpoint too, at least for me mentally, that simplifies the pressure to come up with something something wild, like first come up with a great offer and then you can have fun with the subject line, like you said, as a test or see if you can do something a little more dramatic. Um, so I think it, it, it's efficient and it's effective. And we have tried right. stuff with like, talked about, and stuff like oh, that. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, we have tried fancy designs and stuff like that. One of the things that we found is uh, we have a decent side of our audience who uses uh, let's say older technology as far as like really old Outlook or really old like uh, Mozilla, what's the one, Thunderbird or something like that. So we've found that just getting straight to the point and being very simplistic. And um, we do actually include more personalization now. We include uh, who their assigned mentor is because they all get an assigned mentor now and uh, it'll come from them and all that kind of stuff. So 
we've slowly developed that over time, but we still have the very straightforward design. It's quite plain, but it comes up well in a variety of uh, inboxes. Yeah. The, your most beautiful message doesn't matter if it doesn't uh, reach their inbox or isn't readable in their inbox. So uh, I, yeah, I love that priority. Okay, it's time for results. So Randy, talk to us. What we just saw kind of like the data, the campaign, some individual messages, what was actually a result of this campaign as far as retention and, and other things maybe your team saw? Yeah, sure. So since we've changed so much over the years, it's hard to like nail down like an exact number because <laughs> uh, we've done stuff like on-screen retention offers. We've completely shifted uh, how our pricing and strategy works and stuff like that. But the closest apples to apples things I could find uh, was when we switched even from our manual support process to our automated one. We had a boost of a couple percent. And then when we switched from that automated tool to custom.io, we had another few percent, around 3%. So while we've 3% increased from going from that tool to custom.io, I would say our overall is like, we're probably capturing the like five to 7% of people who have canceled. Um, so like, I would say our recovery rate is pretty high from what I've seen in the past, uh, depending on like, especially on what time frames you use. So in the campaigns, like the screenshots I shared, um, in order to convert, because you can choose your own conversion goals and custom to IO, um, we only had it convert if it was within three days of that email sending, which is a pretty tight time window. Um, but when I look at the overall scope view, um, you know, we're, those emails are probably converting double uh, or more of what it's actually in the conversion window there. So, you know, we've added on several percent to our retention rate as far as like, let's say, I'm gonna use not real numbers here, but let's say if before we were recovering 15% of our monthly users uh, who canceled and we would be more like 20% now, so of the overall. In addition, uh, we don't have a full-time staff member working on retention now anymore. Um, they, they kind of get to split their time across some other stuff now. Um, and we've increased our cancellation volume, I'd say three times since we made the switch. So it initially saved us about 35 uh, person hours a week. And I would say it's probably saving us more like 70 if we were still doing it that same way. We couldn't have keep doing it the same way because we have so many cancellation requests a month now just because of how much we've grown. Um, but it is a significant savings in that way as well. Yeah, that's kind of the, the good one, two punch of your kind of, I think, what did you call it earlier? It's kind of a, you can turn it into sort of a revenue engine by automating these things the right way, um, like you have and getting that increase in retention. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, 35 hours a week, um, person hours per week, that's almost a full-time role that then can be used to advance the product in other ways. So yeah, that's kind of great to see kind of the, hey, here's how it impacted bottom line, but also here's internally we're just a lot more efficient with it so i think that's what we all strive for we all want the both the the thing that shows up on the metric and then also the um the time back uh, when, to do other things i will say it's also a pretty stressful role so not only is it like saving hours it's also saving a lot of uh, i'd say emotional investment for people because we still have to like do the follow-up emails and the follow-up phone calls if they do read the emails um but I would say it's like also causing a lot less stress within the organization. Yeah, and that's, yeah, that's something to be said as well. I was talking to someone the other day, another customer user who um, is at a subscription-based company that has a mobile, mobile and web apps. Um, and they were just talking about how um, there's a lot being asked of them right now currently too, especially as um, companies are, like we said at the start of this, in the context, tightening up, tightening up budgets, tightening up, um, processes and looking more critically at that stuff, kind of like a lot's being asked, but then the ability to kind of, I think, as they put it, do the work of multiple people, um, or, or set it up in a way that does the work of multiple people using automation and stuff like this, um, really has kind of eased that pressure to saying, okay, like I'm being asked to do almost the, the job of two people, but I can pull it off because I, I'm able to, like you said, set up webhooks that that automate these tasks or run a cancellation process that's completely automated and looks like it's coming from a human maybe, but but isn't actually um, on the back end. Yeah, cool to see these examples. No, I enjoyed it. I guess as we wait for just in case anybody has any questions, um, one question that I have is 
um, super impressive kind of what this campaign was able to do for you both on the retention standpoint, recovery standpoint, percentage wise, but then also the, the hours saved. But if you were going to set it up again or build it again, are there anything on your mind of like, oh, I would do this differently or I would do this differently? Yeah. So when we initially set it up, we were brand new in custom to IO. It was actually one of the first things I think we built in custom to IO. Um, and back when we did it, we depended pretty heavily on attributes uh, in general. And one of the things we found is um, we have a completely custom e-commerce system. We have a very custom tracking system, everything like that. Uh, just because it was a necessity back in 2012 when we started to like build our own because no one could really handle what we were trying to do. Um, so as a result of that, um, everything's an internal tool. So sometimes attributes don't get updated. And the problem with attributes is if they don't get updated to the correct thing, uh, they're whatever they were previously. So we are slowly shifting to an event-based model where we can say uh, trigger all of our cancellations, the cancellation reasons over time, especially like we'll have some serial cancelers, I would say. So there will be a very small percentage of our membership who will, you know, maybe in the last year as a monthly member, they've canceled 10 times, but always come back um, through either a retention offer or like sometimes we won't send those retention offers anymore. So if we have it as an event based system, it's a lot easier to say, well, this person's canceled three times in the last 10 days. Uh, maybe just don't send them that message anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it just helps, uh, with attributes. Um, if you do have anything kind of go out of date, you need to do a kind of full resync in order to get everything back to the point that you want it. And that's a issue on our system end, but it's probably something that some of you will run into. Um, so if you set everything up as events, it's just a, a much easier workflow to troubleshoot and understand, you know, where in your campaign you either have the wrong rule set or you should be triggering things in different ways. Yeah, appreciate you talking through that. For folks in the audience too, who maybe um, are not customer users, events and attributes are called a bunch of different things and different tools. So uh, attributes, I think a lot of times are called properties, like things like first name, last name, subscription type, more of those static things that update from time to time, but they aren't actual uh, behaviors that are happening. Whereas events, um, as we call them, as a lot of platforms call them, um, are more of those like logged in, signed up, attended session. And that's all completely custom to, to what your app needs or what events you want to track. I know um, at the most extreme level, some folks are capturing every, you know, times people click different things in the app as they're going through in a mobile app session. Um, so you can decide exactly what things you want to actually capture and act on and, and measure and attribute inside of custom rail. Randy, I'm curious, is there any other tools in your tech stack that maybe um, are some of your favorites or that you found especially interesting lately? I think we're all thinking about um, all the new tools that are coming out all the time. Um, do you have any in your tech stack that you're like, this is where I spend a lot of my time or this plays really well with custom rail or other tools in my stack? Yeah, so tool, two tools we use fairly often right now are Typeform and Bonjaro. So I'm not going to specifically recommend Bonjaro. It's worked really well for us. But um, basically, it's a personalized video tool. So what we can do is we can trigger in a campaign, um, basically send over an email message and the reason that we're wanting a video message. It goes to the Bonjaro app, and then our actual content creators will hop on there. And let, let's say... In smaller brands, we'll do even cancellation there sometimes. So they'll just send them a quick message saying, hey, I saw you canceled. Is there anything I can do to help? And it sends out a personalized email to them. Or when they're onboarding in a trial, um, a lot of times we'll do something called roll-ups. So we'll take whoever signed up in that day. So let's say it's 10 to 20 people, something like that. We'll roll them up. We'll say, hey, you know, it's January 25th. You know, I realize you're starting your piano stuff now. You know, we've assigned you mentors. Please feel free to reach out to them. I'm here to support you as well. You know, we love that you've joined us and we hope you have like a great experience on the piano, something like that. Um, so those will be done every day um, by one of our um, people who's like actually an on-screen personality. Um, and then we also use Typeform for basically collecting feedback. So one of the things you can do is you can include in the webhook. Um, for us, we do Musiora ID. So every person has a unique ID. So we just include that as a hidden field. So when you click on a type form link, it'll fill out a hidden form and type form so we can identify which person it is, as well as any responses they put in there. 
we do let them know that anytime we do that kind of a thing, we do let them know that we're uh, tracking uh, that your Musor ID is collected, but it just helps us say, okay, if we're building customer personas, it's great. If we're asking like, what kind of genres and stuff do you like, or what kind of songs are you wanting in the platform? It's just a very like off the hip kind of way of doing it rather than building a form on our website, you know, doing a landing page, asking them to collect it all in there. Marketing can spin up a, their own type form. They can include their own, in their own email, do the webhook themselves and make all that work. Do you use the info from that form for any kind of personalization, kind of like the campaign we just saw, or is that more of a just mm -hmm. uh, good feedback to continue to consider as you build more stuff? We can ingest that feedback if we want to in our database. Um, that's a bit more of a manual process. Generally, if we want in-platform behaviors to be modified, we'll go through the step of like building our onboarding. So when you first become a Musora member, you provide information about uh, what kind of skill level you have, what kind of genres you like. You can subscribe to coaches on our platform based on that information. Um, so we'll provide a recommended list. You know, there's a, there's a few things that happen there. Um, well, I probably wouldn't set that up as a stable workflow <laughs> for feeding stuff directly back into our platform. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. Folks in the audience, if you have any last questions, um, we're going to wrap here soon. So make sure to put them in. Um, one last thing I had for you, Randy, is we talked a lot about email today. Um, is there any other channels that you use or are primary ones that you saw for engaging your users? Man, so we do push notifications and we're working on getting in-app messaging working. Um, however, <laughs> we've seen a real push to get people into SMS. And uh, what I will say is uh, you have to be extremely confident in your sending team and in your automations and workflows to be sending text messages because you get a little bit of leeway if you send like a faulty email or something like that. It's like, it's kind of whatever, it's email. But if you're sending an SMS, it's like, it's really easy to cause offense, I would say. Uh, you have to be extremely sure of what you're sending. You have to be extremely sure of the audience you've created and that uh, what you've sent is worth interrupting their day for. Um, it's not something we use very much right now. We're considering using it for reminders of like, if they want to subscribe to like practice reminders or something like that to something that's very like immediate. Um, we're not really using it on the marketing side or even in like member notifications right now. Yeah, that's a common sentiment. I've heard a lot of people thinking about of, yes, this has the potential to be a high converting channel because it does hit the customer in such an intimate spot right in their right in their text messages with their family group chat, you know, right above it and things like that. So, but at the same, you know, line of thinking, it also is that really intimate spot. So it, am I helping or hurting the customer experience by popping up next to mom and dad's group chat um, and, and how do I be a good steward of, of that inbox? So, yeah. Yeah, good, it's, good it's one of those there. things where it's a little scary to me as like, because uh, we're very focused on being a positive aspect in people's lives overall. <laughs> so I would say it's maybe a little different for us than for other things. Like, let's say I was a hotel or I was like a, a ride share or I was like a, some sort of service where like immediate feedback is like really helpful. I could definitely see SMS. It's just for us, it doesn't like, there's no like <laughs> urgent reason why you should be all of a sudden practicing at your uh, drum set or that uh, we need to let you know about a pro yeah. on piano. You're on the city bus. You probably don't have your drum set right in front of you to start right away. So uh, that SMS prompts you in that moment. You might not be able to take action anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right, Randy. Well, thank you so much. Um, audience members, thank you so much for joining us. But uh, yeah, Randy, we appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing such detail. I think that's when I come to these kind of events, I really appreciate when folks actually dive in and show us screenshots and show us specifics of like the tactics they took, the things that they learned. So um, I really appreciate all the preparation you did in ahead of this. And yeah, I hope everyone in the audience got a lot out of it. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. It was it's always fun talking shop a little bit and showing off some of the stuff we do. And I hope it, uh, I, I got some real key help, I'd say early on when I was trying to do these things and uh, I'm just trying to share a little bit of that out there. So thank you. Oh, we appreciate it. All right, everybody in the audience, thanks so much. And we hope you, we see you on the next one next Tuesday, our email deliverability workshop. All right, cheers y'all.